So I got to ask you, when you're doing like a two-part film like this and you want the audience to kind of jump right back in after having a couple months, you know, off in between them, what's what's the secret? What it, what was your what was your mindset behind that? Were you wrapped the first movie? Uh, were you wrapped the second movie by the time the first one came out? Did you tweak things? Curious. Yeah, no, we had shot everything all together. Um, yeah. You know, so it was all it was because it's one story really, and so there was no. Uh, and we were almost done with movie two uh, editorially when movie one came out. So it really hasn't been changed um, from what we did. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think that the idea for me anyway for movie two is really like we've collected the team um, and now we need to kind of understand the why of the fight. And uh, before we go into the, 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 the this battle with the Imperium, so... Yeah, movie two is all about like understanding the characters, you know, in a lot of ways. You cannot win. Sophia, you've said before in interviews that this was probably one of the biggest challenges of your life doing this part, both movies. And I got to ask you, with training included and everything, how much of a time commitment was this for you? Because I imagine like this must have been years of your life, right? Doing these doing these films. Uh, yeah, I mean, no, this uh, Rebel Moon took like a year, an okay. entire year from the moment I started with the stunts till when I wrapped, and mm -hmm. uh, and a year investment and a year um, of, um, of yeah, spending time with the character and and just living in that skin, in Cora's skin, basically. And what was the most challenging aspect? It must have been, I imagine that the physical aspect and the fight scenes must have been something that was insanely difficult to pull off, right? What was the most challenging aspects? I think um, for me, and I know, it's, it's, I, know, I don't know if that might sound, sound weird, but it was really the, the gun training. I wanted mm. Cora to really be believable. Uh, I wanted it to be very believable that she trained, that's what she, that she was a war machine basically, and that she was raised to be a soldier and that was a soldier and, and very, very, very good at it. And I, I, for me, the physical aspect of learning the choreography was not as hard as like learning how to hold a gun mm -hmm. and tucking your elbows and having your fingers on, not on the trigger when you didn't need to have it there and like just what you do with your eyes, like instinctively I, I, would, I would close one eye but in reality you have to keep both eyes open and it's just like for it to be steady where, when the rest of your body is moving. Anyway, the training for that was really I was nervous that I couldn't, that I wasn't going to be able to be believable. And I remember the stunt team uh, with Freddy, Spider, and Mel, who were incredible to me and so, so incredibly helpful. They wanted me to learn choreography, and I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to do stunt. I wanted to do gun training. And they're like, yeah, we could do that later. And they thought the other part was harder for me. I said, no, I wanted to do the gun training. But anyway, that was the ch most, the biggest challenge for me. You're all here. because there is nothing to return to. Dark days lie ahead of us all. Yeah. So, Ed, I gotta ask you, okay, so General Noble's been through quite a bit since the last, since the last movie, and I really liked kind of the evolution of your performance, because in the last film, he was kind of like really swaggering with his stick and beating the crap out of people. I wouldn't say that he's mellowed in this movie, but there's a certain like tinge of vulnerability to him that I kind of like that you did in this, although he's probably even more sadistic. Can you talk a little bit about where we find him in the follow-up as opposed to the first film? You know what, the only intent that like, it's so nice to hear people chart exactly what you were trying to do. Mm. So <laughs> yeah, that yeah. means that- You did your, you, you, it, it, you it paid your, off yeah, what, yeah. what I, set out to do so it's really good to hear that um yeah the first the first noble 1.0 was theatrical was thespian like and you know enjoyed the audience enjoyed you know his tongue was his weapon mm -hmm. um and in part two well at the end of part one it was very clear to me the scene that we got to do together which was such a joy it was a great scene um is when you you realize, oh, there is vulnerability to this man. He is subservient to someone else. 
this guy who's the big bad guy is not the biggest baddest guy. You know, so I, that, <laughs> that for me was like a really important moment for Noble, but of course for the narrative which, you know, I'm only here to serve. And then in the second half, of course, you know, being, <laughs> getting my ass handed to me by um, Cora, you know, it's, it becomes personal and it becomes more singular. He becomes more singular in his vision of, of, of revenge and, uh, and violence and probably loses because of that, because he loses, he, 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 he loses his pragmatism. We will teach you how to fight. That's impressive. So if it was up to you and people were experiencing this for the first time that maybe haven't seen the first one, would you say that the best way to watch it is as one full movie back to back double bill? Or do you think that people should take a break? They should watch part one, one night, part two, the other night, but like a Godfather where you separate it. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's very, it's very reasonable to watch both movies back to back. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it, if that's what you feel, but by all means, if you want to wait a day, that's great. But I, I think, really for the like most immersive experience would be watching them back to back to really kind of go deep with it. Joyman, I gotta ask you, um, Titus, you're so great in this movie and it's nice to see you fully unleashed and, and, and kicking ass all over the place. Um, <laughs> but I thought also what was great about it is that you really get a sense of what drives Titus in this film. And if you had to define the character one way, how would you define it? How would you, what would you say is his journey? What's the most important thing to him? Oh, uh, Titus was a ferocious uh, 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 strategist, uh, I had to say, um, and um, in terms of story, uh, my uh, direct investment to this story really uh, resonates loudly, given the fact that I'm from Af uh, Africa, uh, the nature of that continent, what he has, uh, you know, overcome, I mean, hasn't even, it's not even done to, you know, uh, uh, overcoming anything really, but it has survived so much, you know, um, and the indoctrination of that continent, I can see it in Rebel mm -hmm. One. I can see it and feel it. And it's, that was extremely tangible for me, for Titus, I, for I that mean, matter, yeah. And I thought your performance was really powerful. I, I did. And Elise, I, ha I have to ask you, um, one of the things that's kind of interesting is you're surrounded by these larger than life kind of characters, right? These, these seven heroes that are kind of almost like myth mythological. Mm. But what I really liked about your character was that she admits at one point, you know, she's never been in a war before and she's being kind of tested for the first time. In a lot of ways, you're the most relatable character in the film. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that in, in some ways being the audience surrogate, I think, to this big fantasy world. Yeah, um, you know, I, I hadn't thought about it that way. I, I, I like that. Um, I think it's really so much of what I felt on set, right? Because it, this was my first film. I was surrounded by all these people I've, I've looked up to that were, you know, incredibly talented, dedicated, inspiring. And so, um, there's this way that I was also on a parallel journey with Melius, where I was trying to figure it out at, uh, every day and, and luckily had some great people to look up to and, and show me where to go. And, and great um, humility in her approach to, uh, you sure. know, on set. Of course, uh, that boy next to him really uh, <laughs> took her to, took her to another the bus. Took, took, took her to another okay. level, but uh, yeah. He's going to say, "Took her work level to another level." Is what he's talking about. I would have really the crux of her life. inspiration and growth. <laughs> Apparently, I'm the muse for Milius. Oh wow! Some people have said I have heard through the grapevine. You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? They can bring that up, Jonathan. <laughs> Guys, I don't know if you can tell, but I've got some weights behind me, and I was doing some put, some sit-ups before after watching the thing. It made, after watching the movie, it really oh, made me think I need to get back to the gym. So do I. How, 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 did you, <laughs> how did you maintain, though, that physique for, like, the entire shoot, though? Because that must have been nearly impossible, right? Being, like, to the continuity. I couldn't imagine what that must have been like. Yeah, you know what? Um, 
often when people ask me about the physicality, I, I find myself trying to be a thespian and be like, well, you know, how this, uh, the, it, it, you know, relates to the state of the, the dystopian future we're living in. And, and, and all that is very true, you know, but, but ultimately what you're asking me is how I, very hard to do it consistently. I was sitting at about five to 7% body fat, which is almost at like a professional standard for bodybuilders and for professional kind of perform, performance uh, weightlifters. And they usually sit, sit like that for three to four weeks and then take three months off and go again. And so very, very difficult if I'm completely honest. And, and um, but again, doing what I said I wouldn't do, super informative to the state of the character and the positions we're all in, you know? Mm -hmm. And again, you know, this is, our, our bodies are part of our, as you call it, instruments of interpretation. And, mm -hmm. and it's such a big opportunity, especially on a show like this, to, to help demonstrate the character and the physicality in these kind of performances is very important. So it really helped, I think, forge that level of discipline, that level of stoicism necessary to play a character such as Tarek or any of these characters. Mm -hmm. The scar gave us a moment. Those this village holds most dear. Everybody's very excited for your director's cut as well. Um, I feel like, so I'm, I'm curious, if you were to say who, in your opinion, is the one that most benefits from the extra screen time? I remember you telling me something that the Jimmy, that there was a lot more Jimmy stuff. Oh yeah, time more Jimmy. Be... Well, really yeah, the person right. who benefits oh. from the more screen time is me. Um, but I think, um, <laughs> and the audience, hopefully. And all um, of us, yeah. Yeah, but um, yeah, because they're each at like an hour or longer each so it's oh wow it's a total of two hours of additional uh material wow. uh, between like the two movies movie. their nightmare is you and i fighting together you must know yeah tons more jimmy uh an incredible in movie one an incredible other opening sequences like a 20 minute long oh. sequence that's just not even that there's no part of in movie in movie one and uh just a lot more um, you know, we were talking about it earlier that even within the body of the movie in a normal scene that you would think would just be like brought from the PG-13 version over, even the individual yeah. takes are slightly different in a lot of the scenes where we just selected. It's almost like an alternate universe version more than a, a we always, because like even the events happen in different orders and like the characters are slightly different, you know, so it's an interesting you know, the, the R-rated universe of Rebel Moon is a different universe than the PG-13. So it's, a, it's an interesting, rather than it being like a continuation or like, an, like additional material, I really do think it's like an alternate universe. So it's, it's kind of cool. It's kind of oh, fun. Nice. Well, the thing that's interesting, though, is you play the opposite, right? You play a guy that hasn't been trained at all no. and that it has to kind of step up and rise to the occasion. And I really liked, I thought your arc in the films was actually one of the better, was one of the best arcs. So as opposed when you're surrounded by all these kind of larger than life characters and you're playing the us character, kind of the window into the franchise, I think, for the audience, Maybe, what's the yeah. process like? Um, well, it, I guess it made Gunnar a little bit easier to relate to, you know, because he's mm -hmm. more of a regular guy, perhaps. And, uh, and it's an honor to to play that character that maybe is a bit easier to identify with and is, is your way into this uh, crazy world that is Rebel Moon. I should destroy them. One of the things that's interesting always about these kind of immersive franchises like Rebel Moon is that they always spark such debate and such strong opinions. I'm always amazed by how personally people seem to kind of take these universes. What is it that you think about them that makes it that people get like so wrapped up in this universe to the point that they almost at times lose reason, I think if you're on Twitter. Like, yeah, I think it's great. So um, I, I think it's cool because, and I think what does it is this kind of, and we really do it, uh, we really sh effort uh, as best we can to make sure that the mythology of the universe is um, is complete and is consistent so that if you want to take a deep dive, the answers are there. And of course, that's one thing that's cool about the director's cut because it answers a lot of the questions I think that people are having right now about whether it be Issa's energy or whether it be, you know, Noble's recovery and all these things like that. You, you get a lot more, um, there's, a, there's a lot of, answers in the director's cut to the to those questions when will we see it i gotta ask i think it's just question. at the end of the summer sometime in august I okay think. nice 
Thank you very and much. And we're going to release them both on the same day, so. I have no choice but to fight. One of the things that is very original and cool about, I think, uh, the world that Zach created is that it's really like low tech and high tech at the yeah. same time. And uh, for example, in part two, uh, it, a, a lot of the story evolves around harvesting the wheat that we have promised to the uh, the forces of the mother world and that we're going to use to to protect ourselves mm -hmm. with so we uh, we practice quite a bit all of us really to uh, to to train <laughs> how, how to harvest yeah. the old school way with uh, using a scythe and, uh, and to look believable sure. yeah, it was yeah. very important for I me to look to believable be, yeah. because that's that's what gunnar does Best. It has to yeah. look like second nature, right? Like you just something mm -hmm. like an extension. Of exactly. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe when we were actually shooting it. You know, we were actually given a scythe. You know how sharp <laughs> those blades are. Like they are give you the actors what? this thing. Yeah, they were real. They were not fake. That never happens. <laughs> Nobody got decapitated. <laughs> no, thank God. Oh my God. Thank God. No. <laughs> This girl give her herself. Go, 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 go! Are you truly prepared to allow this to continue in your name? Fro, I gotta ask you. So, Belisarius, yeah, is the more evil one, I think, is the kind of the emperor of the Rebel Moon um, universe. What I really liked about your performance as well is that you really set up a sense of menace despite the fact that there's not a ton of screen time. So, when you're doing something like that, when you have to make a big impression, you've really only got like a handful of scenes to do it in. Mm -hmm. As an actor, like what's your process? How do you make sure that people are going to know that you're you're the one that everybody <laughs> should be afraid of? Yeah, I mean, the impulse would be to go really, really big and strong and like make a lot of noise. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't necessary for this character. I think he manages to reach this unbelievable position of power through extreme intellect mm. Um, mm -hmm. and he's a master manipulator. Zach always described him to me as a con man and he was like he has conned his way through his life as a young boy even to first of all get to the mother world because he's an outsider in this world it's why he speaks with this weird northern irish accent i don't know where that comes from <laughs> uh, it's not weird <laughs> just northern irish to to be in this unbelievable you know uh, place of power and i like like the like the greatest dictators in history they do that very very quietly and they they cleverly allow other people to do the dirty work for them and they, they so they appear very very clean um, but actually they're just creating their stepping stones to for their rise to power so it's um you know I, I think it's a pretty understated um performance but i think that was right for 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 this character you know um so yeah it was th that's where the menace is yeah in, yeah. in, in, in the understated calculated nature of of Belisarius, mm. for sure.